Hey, before we kick off this service today, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us as we worship our King and seek to grow as disciples of Jesus. Now, whether you're watching this live on a Sunday or engaging with it later in the week, it's our prayer that God would use something today to encourage you in your relationship and your walk with Jesus. And if that's happening, if you are encouraged, we would love to hear about it. If you'd shoot a message to info at journeybible.org so that we can pray for you, so that we can celebrate with you as God is impacting your life. All right. Well, Merry Christmas, everybody. There we go. We got a Merry Christmas, a lot of Christmas cheer in here. So I hope there's a lot of Christmas cheer at home too. So I get it. I have two little kids and everything. So uh, it can be an exhausting week over the weekend and everything. So, but uh, if you don't know me, my name is Colton Tatham. I'm the West Campus pastor here at Journey Bible Church. And uh, I love Christmas time. I love getting to preach around the holidays as well. Uh, I am really excited to say that God is on the move here in our church. Um, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about how so. Um, on Sunday, January 9th, we're going to have team night. Uh, but in the morning, we're actually going to be starting on-site training with our West Campus team at Prairie Center Elementary School. This has been something we've been praying about for a long time. And we're really excited to see this come to fruition. Uh, if all goes well, we're actually open to start worship services and family ministry at the school starting on Sunday, February 6th. Now, if you're still interested in serving as scaffolding, that's one of the illustrations we've been using, or a volunteer for a time, um, you're more than welcome to. Just reach out to me. Um, we'd love for you to join us to be a part of something new as we head into 2022. Just email me, contact me, fill out a Connect card. Uh, for some of you, though, serving in person uh, may not be in the cards, and you know that's totally okay. If it's not, uh, as Pastor Jeff kind of shared, uh, feel encouraged, feel led to give to this year's Christmas offering. A portion of that offering will actually be used to help get this campus started and to sustain us throughout our first ministry year. Again, if you're taking notes or, you know, if you're still waking up, uh, these are the important dates to have on your calendar. So again, January 9th, we're going to have a prayer of dedication and start training for a month. Then on February 6th, we'll start 9.30 a.m. worship services that are in-person, so in-person preaching, in-person worship, in-person ministry. And then our prayer and hope is that on April 17th, we'll have a grand opening for Easter for the whole community to come on that side of town to check out uh, the Journey Bible Church West. And again, if you have any questions, just reach out to me. Now, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Uh, these are the same verses that Pastor Mike preached on last Sunday, yet in this message, we're going to kind of look at the scripture through a different lens, more of a theological lens. Uh, thus, the sermon today is titled, Incarnate Emmanuel, and in it, we're going to explore the incarnation of Jesus, the Son of God. But before we do, if you would, let's pray. Dear Father God, Lord, we just want to thank you so much for the gift of Christmas time. God, thank you for sending your son to live the perfect, sinless life that none of us can live. And God, thank you for sending your son to be the perfect, sinless sacrifice that all of us need. God, help us to believe in Jesus and help us to guard the great joy that comes from knowing Emmanuel as our Lord and Savior. God, I do pray that you would open our hearts and open our minds to receive your word. And God, I pray that you would ready our souls and ready our hands to do your word. God, all this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, if you would, go ahead and follow along in your Bibles as I read Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, 
do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, the verses that I want us to focus in on in this scripture are verses 22 and 23. If you look there, you'll see Matthew is referring to a prophecy. At the time, this happened to be about a 700-year-old prophecy from the prophet Isaiah. Uh, We can actually find this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 in our Old Testaments. But here in Matthew 1, 22 through 23, the New Testament quotes Isaiah again saying, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. There are three quick observations I want us to notice about the birth of Christ right here in this text. First, we should not forget that Advent or the coming of Jesus was foretold by God. Matthew reminds us that the coming of Jesus fulfilled a 700-year-old prophecy from Isaiah. Jesus' coming also fulfilled several prophetic anticipations going all the way back to the book of Genesis, not to mention countless other prophecies along the way throughout the Old Testament. And what this means is that Jesus' coming is no accident. Jesus' coming was foretold. It also means that Jesus' history wasn't somehow fabricated or revised It's why the genealogies in the New Testament are so important. It's why the quotes back to the Old Testament are so important. The early church couldn't just make up what God's word said because the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament, had already been around for well over 400 years. Back in the first century, all one needed to do was simply compare text to see if Christians were wrong. And it just so happens that well-trained Jewish leaders like Paul and Nicodemus, the Bereans, began comparing the Old Testament to the eyewitness accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus, and it only validated the truth. And it strengthened their faith that Jesus was indeed God's Messiah. This world has seen a lot of rulers and reformers come and go. But none of them were ever the fulfillments of centuries-long prophecies for a coming savior. Take any major political leader or celebrity icon, person of influence, religious prophet, And you'll discover that none of them even come as close to Jesus as fulfilling the overwhelming ocean of prophecy that his birth into this world does. Second, we should celebrate the fact that Jesus' birth is miraculous. If you didn't know this, the Bible is actually full of miraculous conceptions. There are women like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Anna, and Elizabeth, and others, all who struggled with the pain of barrenness and infertility in the Bible. Yet, they faithfully struggled, and God intervened to help them in a miraculous way. Yet, when we come to Mary in Matthew chapter 1, 
we have to recognize that God did something special with Mary that was far more miraculous. Not only was Mary part of the fulfillment of a centuries-long prophecy, but she wasn't even pursuing conception or pregnancy. Quite the opposite, she was saving herself for marriage to Joseph. While there are a lot of miraculous births in the Bible, which I hope are a source of comfort to any couple here who might have struggled with barrenness or might struggle with infertility, but really what I want you to see is that there is only one virgin birth in the Bible. This is miraculous and this is special, and that is the birth of Jesus. Because of the virgin nature of his conception, Jesus is a new Adam, a new man, free from the curse of sin. Chosen by God through Mary, Jesus was the one born free in order to set others free. Thirdly, these verses tell us that Jesus' birth involves something theologians call the incarnation. We might say Jesus' coming is incarnational. You see, the miraculous nature of Jesus' birth from a virgin tells us that he is the new man. He is a human being, but he's born into spiritual freedom in this world rather than spiritual bondage like the rest of us are. However, the prophetic nature of his name, Emmanuel, tells us that Jesus is not just a man. Mary's son is God with us. It's worth noting that his name, Emmanuel, is a symbolic name. It's kind of like the title GOAT, G-O-A-T, greatest of all time. You know, if you were to meet Tiger Woods, Michael Phelps, or Tom Brady in person, you know, you probably shouldn't just say, hey, goat, you know, on the street. They might get the wrong idea about that. In the same way, people in the first century didn't go around calling Jesus Emmanuel. Now, Emmanuel is used as a symbolic name just three times in the Bible, twice in Isaiah and once here in Matthew. In both cases, this name is referring to a child who was anointed with the very presence of God himself. Hence, in Hebrew, the meaning of the name is God with us. The significance of Jesus' name as Emmanuel gets reiterated in different ways in the New Testament. One example that's pretty cool is in John 1. In John 1, Jesus is described as the divine word from the beginning, the divine logos who took on flesh. So in John, we're introduced to Jesus as the incarnate word. And here in Matthew, we're introduced to Jesus as the incarnate Emmanuel. Now, every year around Christmas time, churches all over the world celebrate the wonderful arrival of the incarnate Emmanuel over 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. The birth of God's son is both a miracle and a mystery. And in a lot of ways, the birth of God's son is like light. You see, the Bible teaches us that Jesus has two complete natures. He's fully human and fully God. He's 100% human, he's 100% God. For some, this may seem like a contradiction. How do you put these puzzle pieces together? But, you know, I disagree, and here's just one reason why. This image on the screen is an image of light. It's an image of light from an ultra-fast electron microscope. For those of you who've studied a little bit of physics then you'll know that light behaves like an immaterial wave of energy and a material particle of matter, and it does so all at the same time. From this image, we see light fully behaving like a wave on the top scan, and at the same time, light fully behaving like a particle on the bottom scan. Now, how can this be? This poses some questions. How can something be fully immaterial and fully material 
at the same time? How can something be both a wave of oscillation and a point of matter, a particle, at the same time? Does this mean light is a contradiction? Should we stop believing in light? Well, of course not. You'd be a fool to not believe in light just because you don't understand how light works. Although light might be hard to understand, scientists have shown us this is the way light exists and this is the way light behaves. And whether or not you believe it or not, this is the way light is. Light can be fully a wave and fully a particle at the same time. Now answering how this is possible is something people are still trying to explain. Maybe we'll find out the answers one day, maybe we won't. But if something as common as light can have two full natures that might at first seem impossible to exist together, then why would it be so hard to believe that the Bible the word of God really does to reveal to us that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And if God is really the maker of the universe, do you think it's an accident that the maker of the universe would use the nature of light itself to teach us something about the true light of the world himself? Well, God doesn't have accidents. God foretells and God fulfills. Now, when theologians talk about the incarnation of Jesus, we're talking about the way we see and experience Jesus at the particle level as humans. Jesus never stops being God, just like light continues to be a wave. But there is a moment in history when God sent his son to be born in a manger, to walk the world, to proclaim the gospel, to give himself up as a ransom for others. The incarnation of Jesus is the special event of his coming that we celebrate at Christmas time. But what does the word incarnation actually mean? Well, growing up, something I used to make myself for breakfast was called carnation instant breakfast. Has anybody had that delicious powdery mush before? You know, if you haven't, you know, praise God maybe, um, you basically took this powder in a packet, you poured it into some milk, you shook it up in presto sludge and breakfast. It was good. Um, on the old boxes, there used to be a flower. Um, you know, every big company these days has to rebrand their logo, and so they took the flower away, and now it's called Carnation Breakfast Essentials. I don't think it's an essential for your breakfast, but in any case, if you don't know what a carnation is, you might not know that it's actually a flower. You know, it's not on the box anymore. But in any case, you know, the word carnation comes from Latin kind of an interesting word. It refers to the wreath-like crowns that um, Latin rulers, uh, Romans, and the Greeks would wear. Uh, it's why carnation, the word carnation, sounds a lot like coronation. Uh, they're similar words. One means the crown itself. The other one means like crowning a king. You coronate a king. Carnation flowers like this uh, pink one on the slide, they get their names because the flowers themselves kind of look like a tiny crown that maybe you'd put on a tiny prince or a tiny princess. With the word prefix thrown in there, the word incarnation literally means something like crown coming down. Crown coming down. When the crown comes down from heaven, the divine son himself takes a human nature. He is embodied. Now, to be incarnate doesn't mean that you lose the crown. It doesn't mean that you lose the deity. Just because you're embodied doesn't mean that you're not the king anymore. Theologian Wayne Grudem defines the incarnation pretty simply this way. He says, the incarnation was the act of God the son whereby he took to himself a human nature. Again, the incarnation was the act of God the Son, whereby he took to himself a human nature. Jesus is fully human, 
and Jesus is fully God. Jesus is one son with two complete natures. But at this point of the message, some of you might be wondering, why does this matter? Well, that's where I want to go next. I want to show you just one reason why believing in his full humanity matters and one reason believing in his full deity matters. And if you have one without the other, or if you have one more or less than the other, what we're going to see is that you don't really have the Lord and Savior anymore. So let's look at Jesus' humanity first. For this, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Again, that's Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, and we'll also have it up on the screen here. Uh, this passage is one that describes the priestly role of Jesus. The interesting thing about the role of a priest is that it's primarily a role for a human being. The priest is normally a appointed human who mediates on behalf of other humans to and from God. So the very acknowledgement of Jesus' priestly role in Hebrews is actually kind of an acknowledgement of his human nature. So in describing Jesus, these verses in Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 say this. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, what should stand out to you in this verse here or in these passage is really that Jesus is the priest, the priest with the human nature who sympathizes. Jesus became fully human to sympathize with us. As a man, he knows what it's like to be tempted by power. As a man, he has felt the pain we feel when a close loved one dies. As a man, he has experienced our outrage towards evil that we face in a lost, broken, and hurting world. And as a man, he knows what it's like to have a disappointing holiday. Fully human means fully sympathetic. If we've been there, Jesus has been there too. Except in the case of Jesus, Hebrews 4.15 tells us that he's the better high priest who's never let his circumstances or temptations lead him into sin. In this respect, Jesus is truly better than any man. When we think now of the worst of employers, the greediest of bosses, the most miserly of men, we might think of Ebenezer Scrooge from Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. It's written all the way back in 1843. In his book, Charles Dickens writes and describes Scrooge as a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, clutching, covetous old sinner hard and sharp as flint, secret and self-contained, and solitary as an oyster. Now, all of us have probably met a few Scrooges in our lives, and maybe some of us have acted like a Scrooge from time to time. You know, many think that their great dilemma in life is that they don't have enough. They don't have enough resources. If only I had more money, if only I had more time, if only I had this or that, then this wouldn't have happened. But the tale of Scrooge reminds us that even men who have all the money, all the time, and all the things can find themselves lonely, sad, and afraid on Christmas. Scrooge's great dilemma is not that he didn't have the resources to be a kind of great dilemma is that he let his sin make his heart cold and bitter 
and closed off to others. Most of all, he had closed himself off to God. It took the visit of three ghosts, and you know in my interpretation, perhaps three ghosts to a sinner, but maybe three angels to a saint, to shatter the cold heart of Scrooge. And the big lesson that the old man needed to learn was the lesson of sympathy. You know, one of the unfortunate effects of the COVID pandemic in our country has been the polarization of causes and the intensification of opinions. There's not a lot of sympathy or charity for others in the world right now. We live in a culture that encourages us to view people who think differently than us as enemies, us versus them. We live in a society that is quick to punish mistakes and very slow to extend forgiveness and grace. The pandemic has led to circumstances where many kind people have acted very Scrooge-like from time to time. But imagine instead if the church viewed our world like our high priest Jesus does. Imagine how bright a light the church would shine in the darkness. Imagine if we viewed others as victims, as casualties, as people who need God's spiritual help. Well, we are not going to find the strength to be sympathetic from ghosts and from Christmas fables. The only place we're going to find the strength for sympathy in hard times is for the one who first showed sympathy to us, Emmanuel. So don't be a Scrooge. Just think of the difference God would make through all of us if every church strived to show the sympathy of Jesus to others. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. You know, the funny thing about Scrooge is that his first name is Ebenezer. In Hebrew, the name literally means stone of help. And it comes from 1 Samuel seven twelve. In this Old Testament book, the Israelites are attacked by the Philistines, but God delivers them and God gives them victory. The last judge, Samuel, who just so happens to be a son of a barren woman named Anna that we mentioned earlier, raises up a commemorative stone, and that stone is called an Ebenezer, and he does so to remind the nation of Israel that God helped them in their time of need. So in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, Scrooge's name is kind of a play on words. Ebenezer Scrooge is not the stone of God's help. Ebenezer Scrooge is the stone who needs God's help. Consider this. Is there someone in your life who you know that needs God's help right now? There's someone in your life that you tend to view as a harsh stone that perhaps could become a stone of help to others. You know, if God is bringing someone to mind, my encouragement to you would be to pray for that person. Ask God to give you the same sympathy for this hard person that Jesus has for you. So again, Don't be a Scrooge as we head into the new year. Be an Ebenezer who points to God's help. Remember that the source of our sympathy for others flows from Jesus's sympathy for us. His sympathy is just one reason why his incarnation, his humanity, the crown coming down matters. If you live cut off from Jesus, then don't be surprised when the world makes you stone cold. But if you live united with Jesus, then you'll discover the capacity to show God's love even when 
uh, people seem bitter and solitary and lonely and angry. Now, there's so much more that could be said about the humanity of Christ. We could, you know, there's books upon books written about it. We barely exhausted the subject. But, you know, this message isn't just about the humanity of Christ. It's about the incarnation, God with us. And what the Bible teaches us about the incarnation is that Jesus is the human Savior who sympathizes with our suffering. And Jesus is also the divine Lord who secures our salvation. Jesus sympathizes and Jesus secures. Just like two natures of light, Jesus remains fully human and fully God and is fully able and always to do both. Believing in the full humanity and full divinity of Jesus is not some sort of like optional add-on for the Christian faith. It's essential. God makes the existence and importance of the incarnation indisputably clear in his word. So let's take a look now at Colossians 2, 6 through 10 in your Bibles. There, these verses really could not be any clearer about the incarnation. So if you're following along, here's what it says, Colossians 2, 6 through 10. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. If you had any doubt in your mind up to this point about whether or not the Bible spoke of Jesus being fully God, then unless your eyes are closed, verse 9 should clear that all up for you. It says, for in him, in Christ, in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. The whole fullness of deity, all of godness, no part of divinity missing, dwells bodily. That's the wonderful mystery of the incarnation right there. The significance of Jesus' deity is that he's more than only sympathetic. Because he is the son of God, it means he can actually do something about human suffering. You know, I think most of us have experienced what it's like before to be the recipient of obligatory sympathy. Something bad happens in our lives. People hear about it, and they honestly can't really do much about it. So they extend obligatory sympathies. I think most people do it genuinely. It's never good when someone doesn't, but they do so in the form of, I'm sorry. But the suffering... The pain, the hurt, well, it still remains. It still stays there. You see, in Jesus, his deity is what gives him the power to actually redeem suffering, not just sympathize with it. Jesus isn't just the incarnate Emmanuel who came into this world so that God could feel sorry for us. Jesus is God the Son who was sent with a mission from God the Father to save a perishing people. And because Jesus is fully God, Jesus has the full power to take suffering and then secure salvation for you. And the great evidence of Jesus' true humanity is his death on the cross. But the great evidence of Jesus' true divinity is his resurrection from the tomb. You know, if you've never thought about it before, a being who is fully God is an eternal being that really can't die. Yet the very nature of Jesus' incarnation is what makes it possible for the Son of God to suffer unto death and then still raise himself up unto life. 
Suffering exists in this world because sin exists in this world. Suffering exists because people rebel against God. Even so, Jesus came into this world. The crown came down to make a way through suffering and to achieve a victory and to secure salvation for all who would believe. You know, Paul tells us in his letter to the Corinthians that the entire Christian faith hinges on just one historical event, and that event is the resurrection. I hope it clicks for you, though, that without the incarnation, we'd only have a halfway Savior. Only an incarnate Savior can become a resurrected and reigning Savior. The reason why the church celebrates Christmas is because the Lord and Savior who can actually secure salvation once and for all has come. Jesus was born to Mary fully human and his mission was to suffer in the place of other humans to take the punishment for all of our Scroogeness. You see, an animal can't suffer in your place. An angel can't suffer in your place, and not even God can suffer in your place. That is, unless he takes upon himself humanity, perfectly fulfills his own law, innocently suffers his own punishment on your behalf under that law, and then does so in the place of human beings that had broken that law. And the Bible tells us that Jesus suffered as one under the law to do what? To save those condemned by the law. It's kind of sad news, but it's good news. And it's the good news that we celebrate at Christmas. The fullness of deity dwells bodily. Jesus became fully human to suffer so that those of us who follow him could join the Father and join the Son and join the Spirit and the kingdom of heaven forever and ever. Now, during our Christmas Eve service on Friday, Pastor Mike shared a few stories. He shared a few stories about the worst Christmas gifts and some of the most pointless Christmas gifts that he's ended up with. You know, it might sound bad to be ungrateful, but there are some genuinely bad gifts out there. Now, I'm thankful I never ended up with a broken toilet to the white elephant exchange like Mike did. That's just disgusting. I did end up, though, with our church facility manager's old junky sink before. Not nearly as bad, still awful. But you know, in any case, most of us kind of know what it's like to end up with something like buyer's remorse or a late delivery. Anybody had some of those this Christmas? Broken gifts, maybe? Or, you know, straight up, you just get somebody else's junk. It's awesome to get good gifts. Um, It's not so awesome dealing with a broken gift or a thoughtless gift or an obligatory gift. The good news that we can receive and celebrate is that God has made it possible to exchange the broken gifts piling up in our lives for something better, something lasting, something new. Because of the incarnation of Jesus, God has made a great exchange possible. Now, every year around the holidays, my family and I watch the stop-motion movie, Santa Claus is Coming to Town. Now, some of the songs in this movie have not aged well. Um, They're not great, but there's still something nostalgic about watching it. Uh, My favorite part of the movie is the transformation of the winter warlock. He's this mean, icy, cold monster in the mountains trying to stop Kris Kringle from delivering the gifts to children. You know, anybody trying to stop a man delivering gifts to children is pretty bad. So he's definitely a monster. There's a moment, though, in the movie when the big, bad winter warlock receives a gift, though, from Kris. He's absolutely overwhelmed by the kindness that he didn't deserve because he had just trapped Chris in a trap. The cold monster in the movie then begins to kind of melt, and the gift from Chris changes this warlock into a kind, gentle old man. You know, when you think about your own life, what are the bad gifts piling up 
that you wish you could exchange? Do you find yourself these days burdened with gifts like stress, loss, loneliness, selfishness, or gifts you never wanted, like a cold heart, a crippling impulse, or a cynical spirit. You know, my encouragement to you would be to come and lay those bad gifts at the foot of the cross in the same way that you'd place them under a Christmas tree. Come to Jesus full of faith and release your burdens, release your troubles, release your broken gifts to Christ. Don't keep clinging on to them like a closed-fisted miser. Open your hands and open your hearts to Jesus. The incarnation has made it possible for any person with a saving faith to participate in this great spiritual exchange with God. Not only do we release our sins and our shortcomings to Jesus, but Jesus invites us to receive the greater gift of salvation itself. And through salvation comes endless gifts like eternal life, unfailing love, and abundant joy. You know, if you have yet to receive this gift, then I don't know what's keeping you. Don't wait. I want to invite you to do so now. There is no greater gift than you can receive than Jesus. But you know, if you've already received the gift of Christ in your heart, then be sure to share it. Jesus is good news, and he's good news that's meant to be freely given. There are people out there in our world with stone-cold hearts that need melted. They're just waiting. They're just waiting for the saving kindness of Christ. And maybe, just maybe, God has appointed some of you to be the one who's going to give that saving kindness to another. It's good to receive good gifts, but you know, it's even better to give good gifts. You know, today is December 26th, and the Christmas season may, you know, be over, but the incredible gift-giving mission of the church doesn't have to be over. The mission of the church is to keep heralding Keep proclaiming the good news that Jesus has come and that Jesus is coming back again. We have a savior, fully human, who is able to sympathize with our afflictions. And we have a Lord who is fully God, who is able to secure salvation. Journey Bible Church, as we head into a new year, Let's commit ourselves to proclaiming the incarnate Emmanuel to everyone, the good news that God is with us. Let's pray. Dear Father God, we praise you now for giving the world the greatest gift it'll ever receive. God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to be God with us. Help us to follow him with hearts full of faith as we strive to honor you, worship you, and give the gift of Christ to others. God, for those who have yet to commit themselves to the incarnate Savior and resurrected Lord Jesus, God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work to melt the icy prison of doubt, dissent, and disappointment clinging to their souls. God, warm their spirits with the good news and good cheer of Jesus. And God, as we head into this new year, make our church the kind of gift-giving church that honors Christ in word, thought, and deed. All this we pray in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. <laughs>